Coming up on DTNS, the Tesla Cybertruck is here. Russian bloatware is now the law. And Trisha Hershberger tips us off on games for the gifting season. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, November 22nd, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Len Peralta. I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. And uh, as I mentioned, TV host, gamer, and creator Trisha Hershberger back on the show. Welcome back, Trisha. Thank you guys for having me. Oh, it's so so cool to have you. Uh, now that we're on Twitch, you can you can host us. We're like Twitch uh, friends. We're Twitch I guess, buddies. I don't know what's the yeah, word. For yeah, sure. Twitch buddies. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this is exciting. In fact, we were just talking to Trisha about her hybrid electric car. We were talking about solar. We we're talking about building your own PCs. That's all on Good Day Internet. Got to get that extended show at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. The U.S. Department of Commerce granted Microsoft a license to export mass market software to Huawei. Previous U.S. trade restrictions had caused a halt in issuing Windows and Azure licenses to Huawei, causing Microsoft to remove Huawei laptops from its online store and Huawei to postpone the launch of a new Windows laptop of its own. Google updated support documents for cloud print to say there won't be any more cloud print after December 31st, 2020. Uh, cloud print has been around for 10 years in beta pretty much the entire time. It's been it launched back in 2010. Chrome OS now has its own built-in print solution, so it doesn't need cloud print, which is what cloud print was originally launched for. Google promises to add support for external print servers and APIs for third parties to access print job metadata and configurations in Chrome OS before that January 31st deadline, because those are some of the last things taking advantage of it. So uh, another Google product winding down. Let's talk a little more about the Russian Duma, Sarah. Big story on a Friday. The Duma in Russia passed a law requiring certain electronics devices to come pre-installed with Russian software. Non-Russian software may also be pre-installed, but the Russian software has to be there as well. A complete list of Russian-made software that must be included as which devices will be affected will be determined by the government. One of the bill's authors, Oleg Nikolaev, told the BBC that since most devices come with Western applications, consumers, quote, might think that there are no demands domestic alternatives available, end quote. The Association of Trading Companies and Manufacturers of Electrical Household and Computer Equipment warned that some companies may leave the Russian market because it's not possible to install Russian-made software on their devices. The law comes into force in July 2020 for smartphones, computers, and smart TVs. Now, it's a bit of a side note, but I think this is part of the wider uh, Russian strategy to, to create an Internet that could exist only within Russia if it came under cyber attack. There, there are lots of other laws that are targeted towards making the Russian Internet be able to survive on its own if it had to turn itself off. But mostly this is about helping homegrown companies in Russia and giving them a boost. Uh, it could hurt. Companies like Apple, if, if there's a, a an app that the government decides has to be in there and Apple doesn't want it in the app store, for instance, uh, that, that that could be a problem. Or let's say the company doesn't want to go through the app store and says, no, but it's the law that you have to put it on there. All kinds of possibilities for how this could, could mess with companies that want to sell in Russia that aren't from Russia. Yeah, it seems like to me we're going to run into a lot of, you mentioned Apple, but you know, large companies who... It's not that they couldn't do what Russia is asking. They just won't. And they'll say, all right, well, huge market that we have to leave behind for political and business reasons that are pretty complicated. Yeah, Trisha, I don't, I don't know that you've been following. I, I don't expect that you've been following the you know, Russian <laughs> legislation on the Internet uh, t terribly closely. But do you think <laughs> this would work? Do you think this, this would make people want to switch to a uh, uh, homegrown solution because it's well, there. Well, this is definitely the first I'm hearing of this. So thank you, Daily Tech News Show. Um, <laughs> but, it, you know, at first I thought, well, I mean, I guess this is a great way to spread awareness. But then also the user in me and the consumer in me says, "Ugh, it's mandatory government bloatware. Like, mm -hmm. who wants that? Um, so from a consumer perspective, I'm sure this is probably going to be annoying. And my questions are, can you uninstall it after you purchase? Um, but yeah, I mean, you guys bring up a great point that this is going to affect larger companies like Apple and um, have a lot of ramifications other than just, hey, Russia makes apps too. Although you can't be mad at them for trying to support the home team. Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, it also could be a problem for smart TV makers who don't have app stores, 
who say like, we, we put a, a smart OS on there and then we lock it down and that's it. And we'll update those o operate. We don't really have a way to put apps into the store. Uh, yeah. that could be an issue. It's, I, I don't think these things usually work in getting people to switch as we have seen yeah. with the, with the browser ballot and that, that sort of thing. Right. It just, it, it doesn't end up working the way governments want it to work. I can tell you, Samsung's been trying to force Bixby on me for years and it is not <laughs> working. <laughs> they even gave you a button, Trisha. What more do you want? I mean. <laughs> the Twitter safety team announced that users can now enable two-factor authentication without providing a phone number. Or if you have already turned it on, you can remove your phone number and keep your two-factor authentication on. Uh, since 2017, Twitter users who wanted to use a mobile authenticator app or a hardware security key like YubiKey had to enable the SMS-based 2FA first and could not disable it. Uh, that left logins open to SIM swapping exploits because even if you had the authenticator, someone could use your SMS if they could get a hold of it. And uh, a SIM swap attack was used to gain access to Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey's account on August 30th this year. And here we are just about three months later with Twitter saying, you know what, maybe we won't uh, make you have an SMS two-factor authentication option. You know, normally I'd say, oh, you know, Trisha may or may not have thoughts about this, but I bet this week you do. I do have lots of <laughs> thoughts about this, as a matter of fact, because I was hacked this week. Mm. Um, so for anyone listening, this is what we were talking about before the show. I woke up Monday morning to a slew of SMS two-factor authentication oh, in, no. uh, text messages and um, a whole bunch of emails telling me all of my passwords have been reset to just about every account you can imagine. Like, take it all the way back to, like, when people used Snapfish. Do you remember wow. Snapfish? Wow, yeah. Like, no, I remember Snapfish. Snapfish. Yeah. I think like, I did some greeting they, cards with that. Everything, yeah. got everything. Um, and fortunately didn't send anything out from any of my social media or anything like that. I think they were just fishing for sensitive information. Um, but SMS two-factor is what saved me. But I can 100% relate to not wanting that on there because what happened to me is they had hacked an, a very, very old AOL account that I didn't mm. realize was a recovery email on my G Suite account. Uh -huh. And then they used that to get into my G Suite. And then from there, got everything else. Um, but I, it was it made me so mad because so many of these accounts that did have two factor had email and text two factor. And because they were into that email, they could just use email. So it didn't even matter that I had SMS two factor turned on because they were just going in through the email. So I can relate to this when people say it doesn't even matter that I have an authenticator on my phone because they're just using SMS to get in anyway. So I would like to see, in general, companies adapt a way more widespread and consumer chosen approach to two-factor authentication and security. Um, and because my G Suite, this was really fun. So once I got my G Suite back and locked out the intruder, they actually backdoored in through my domain to get it back again. Oh, wow. Um, and then I was dealing with the person, the, the domain hosting, the website hosting and domain site that I originally bought the domain from, who didn't have two-factor at all, oh, man. Uh, which was a huge nightmare. So I, I ended up getting it resolved, knock on wood, no issues in a few days. But this kind of nightmare, it, it makes you feel very vulnerable um, especially when you feel like you don't have control over securing your own accounts. So yeah. I, I mean, with Jack Dorsey getting hacked, I think that I don't endorse hacking ever. I think hackers in movies are awesome. Hackers in real life suck. Um, I don't endorse hacking, but it certainly sent the message to Twitter. Yeah. Jack I mean, the, 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 the advice we always give people is turn on two factor authentication, but sometimes you don't have the option or they did things like Twitter where they made you use a less secure version of it. Uh, and I, I've had arguments, I've had arguments with Patreon whom I love about, you know, giving me an option that doesn't involve SMS because yeah, it's probably not going to be SIM swapped until the day that it is. And then, right. you know, this is what happened with Twitter. Jack Dorsey's like, yeah, it's probably not worth now. It's totally worth the engineering resources to do this because it happened to him. Yeah, it's, it's totally worth it to have as much security as possible. <laughs> Move, moving on to cool vehicles. Uh, Tesla unveiled its Cybertruck on Thursday. They had a great demo, and it was a demo fail. Uh, Tesla head of design, Franz von Holzhausen, hit the side of the car with a sledgehammer. No effect. It's made from the same stainless steel as SpaceX's rockets. So they were hoping for a different 
result. But when he threw a metal ball at the windows, it cracked them twice. They were supposed to not crack. Uh, however, the truck has some great specs. Features a sharp angular design, comes in three models, a single motor real, rear wheel drive with a 250 mile range, seven, uh, 700, 7,500 pounds of towing capacity, and a zero to 60 MPH time in under 6.5 seconds. That one goes for $39,900. A dual motor all wheel drive model with 300 miles of range, uh, 10,000 uh, LBs of tow capacity, and a zero to 60 time and under 4.5 seconds goes for $49,900. And a tri-motor all-wheel drive model, 500 miles of range, 14,000 pounds towing capacity, and a zero to 60 time of under 2.9 seconds goes for $69,900. Autopilot will come standard with Tesla's full self-driving capability available for an additional $7,000. Tesla is taking refundable $100 uh, $100 deposits to reserve a truck and assembly is scheduled to begin in late 2021 with triple motor models beginning in 2022. Who wants one? Trisha, nope. you just got an electric nope. plug-in hybrid, so you're probably <laughs> not going to jump for this, but, but they're, they're <laughs> not as expect expensive as I expected them, uh, at least on that base model uh, one, but they're still real pricey. Yeah, they're still pricey. I mean, the the towing stats are crazy. Yeah. Um, and I love that they do the traditional Tesla thing of get in now for this very, very low price. And, you know, you'll get it in a few years. Because I think a lot of people see this DeLorean looking Cybertruck and think, oh, man, 100 bucks sold. Yeah, why not? If it's refundable, <laughs> you know, just get in there and, 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 and make it happen. But then, of course, set your clocks for two years from now when they're not delivering the ones that people expected and, and all of that, which may or may not happen, but that's happened before. Uh, there's also uh, Elon Musk tweeting out extras that he didn't have in the announcement yesterday, for instance, a possible solar panel add-on to go over the bed of the truck that would give you an extra 15 miles of charge per day. Uh, so the, expect more of that kind of thing. Plus, the you could see whatever movie you want in this design. Some people see Batman. Some people see Terminator. Some people see Transformers. Uh, it's a it's a crazy design, and yet it's real. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this it it is. We were talking in the pre-show. This is a concept car that you'd see at CES and go, yeah, right. okay, whatever. I'll never, you know, that'll never be on the road. This is something Tesla's actually doing. Uh, where I ended up moving recently is truck country, let me tell you. Uh, and just the idea that I could be like, I could be the cyber truck girl in the neighborhood and haul a lot of stuff, you know, and mm. plug plug it in behind me, you know, yeah. with my, you know, 2001. Uh, it, 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 uh, there, it's not happening, not happening anytime soon. I already got a new card less than a year ago, but I do want this. I just want a cyber truck just to have it. Now that you've put it that way, I want you to have it. Like I, I just, <laughs> I mean, talk of the town, let yeah, me tell right? you, you know, it's a That's small amazing. town, but, but, but it would be, it would be quite the flex. Uh, we're going to return to the, the mysterious uh, Valentine's Day text message delay again. Uh, on November 7th, at least 168,000 text messages that had been sent nine months earlier suddenly got delivered nine months later. Uh, apparently, that's about a half second's worth of messages in the U.S. Uh, the short version of how this happened is a server from message processor Cineverse went offline February 14th, wasn't rebooted again until November 7th, and that's when the messages got sent. The Verge has taken a little time to do an in-depth look at Cineverse and what happened. Industry experts told The Verge that the delayed messages should not have been sent even when it was turned back on because a server being reconnected should automatically be clean so that no remaining messages get sent. Plus, SMS messages have a 15-day expiration anyway. So if you're respecting the standard, you would see that they were more than 15 days old and, and get sent. So it's still a little mystery of how this actually happened. There's also the matter of who Cineverse is. Cineverse is a Tampa, Florida-based provider of back-end services for almost all the wireless carriers in the United States. It works a little like transit providers do on the internet, if you know how that works. So if AT&T wants to deliver a text message outside its network, it's easy to do it inside its network, right? Because it operates the network. But if it wants to send a message to a T-Mobile customer, it sends it to Cineverse, which adapts it to T-Mobile's protocols and sends it along. AT&T, T-Mobile, and Sprint use Cineverse. Verizon uses SAP, but Cineverse pretty much dominates the industry. 
A smaller message service company out of Germany called Tintech is suing Cineverse for anti-competitive behavior because it claims that instead of honoring a contract to exchange messages for free, kind of a a peering arrangement, Cineverse wants to charge a per-message fee that Tintech says would bankrupt it if it agreed to it. Federal magistrate judge has recommended ruling in Cineverse's favor, though. Uh, so Cineverse has just kind of bought up the industry. And there's a similar thing happening with some transit providers as well that has concerned some folks in that end of the industry. So could be a little bit of a cautionary tale here, too. Yeah, it. I think the naive question, you know, that I always, uh, my, my first question is, well, why wouldn't the carriers just build in this infrastructure so they don't have to use a company that's going to lead them astray? But Cineverse, nobody had ever heard of this company because it was working just fine until the Valentine's Day text went missing. And even then, nobody noticed until they all got them seven months later. So, it, you know, it's it's interesting how you know, these large carriers, you kind of you kind of figure the infrastructure is all happening behind the scenes uh, on their dime, but it's not. It, much like there are third party services that we find out about all the time with large social network platforms. Same thing, where you go like, well, why can't you just do that yourself? Well, because the company doesn't want to deal with it, and it's cheaper to 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 hire somebody else to do it. Well, especially because uh, AT&T, T-Mobile, Sprint, and then all the rural carriers, like it does make more economic sense to have a third party say, you know, I'll handle this for all of you. That's why we have transit providers on the internet instead of all the edge ISPs handling it, because it just makes economic sense. Well, Tricia, I hope uh, no Valentine's Day texts uh, were lost in your life. <laughs> uh, no, I just can't imagine like... Has sending a, a steamy Valentine's text and then, you know, that relationship ending. And then nine months later, that text sure. goes through. I know, I yes. Some very awkward moments. For very, sure. very awkward at best. Yeah. All right, moving on to some robots. Shall we? Alphabet's X company announced the Everyday Robot Project with the goal of developing a general purpose learning robot. The idea is to use cameras and machine learning to have that robot learn from the world around them so that every movement doesn't actually need to be coded. X is testing its robots in a workplace environment with the first robots learning how to sort trash. Nearly 30 robots spend part of the day separating compost, landfill, and recyclables. Oh my gosh, I wish I had one already. Virtual robots practice grabbing things in simulated buildings. The virtual robots data is combined with real world data and a system update. So the real robots, uh, to the real ro robots every week or two. X says that the robots put trash in the wrong place about 5% of the time, so they're doing pretty well compared to 20% that humans do. I'm sorry, it's just funny to me that humans put the trash in the wrong bins 20% of the time. That's one out of five. Well, yeah, is it because they're moving too fast? I think it's because they don't care all that much. So that's another reason that a robot is good for this sort of thing, because the robot's like, no, I know what's right. I only have one compost job. Compost goes in the compost bin. <laughs> yeah, though this is this is early days for something, and and maybe one of the practical benefits will be actually sorting trash. That is that is a real world problem that needs to be much more complex than what they're testing here. At the end result, when you dump everything in your recycling bin, having sorted into this kind of plastic, that kind of plastic aluminum would be excellent. That, that would help recycling industry quite a bit. I don't think that's the only thing they plan for this. This is just how they're they're training this. But I, I think it's fascinating to, that you were taking that machine learning and putting it in the robots now to to see if we can get the robots to actually learn how to move on them on their own without having to program them. That's a, that could be a big advance. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. All right, folks, uh, it's that gift giving season. Uh, we've got Black Friday coming up here. Actually, I mean, it's Black Friday kind of smeared itself out over the whole month. We've already got sales happening, uh, not just here, but in Europe as well. Singles Day was in China and most of Asia earlier in the month. And you might be thinking like, all right, I want to get somebody a game. What should I get them? Thank you, Tricia for joining us today to help us figure out what some of the cool games are that you might want to give somebody. Dun, 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 dun. I'm here. Um, so I wanted to start off by going over some cool hardware gifts for gamers. So if for the person maybe who you're like, this is the person that I'm going to do the big item for, or mm -hmm. I'm looking for the big spend item for someone, some stuff that might not be on the radar. I feel like a lot of people that are 
kind of outside of the uh, immediate gaming family think, oh, I should get them a console. A console is always a great gift. However, Xbox One and PS4 have been around a while now. So a lot of the gamers you're gifting for might already have those big things. So things I would suggest. Uh, the Oculus Quest VR headset. Have any of you played with the Oculus Quest yet? No, I have the Go, but I haven't got a chance okay. to play with the Quest, which I hear is like 20 times better. Uh, so the Quest is the same price as the Rift S. But the Quest doesn't need to be tethered to a machine. So uh, formerly, prior, for a fantastic VR experience and an Oculus headset, you would have to be tethered to a VR-capable, pretty beefy PC. Um, but the Quest is standalone, which not only means it's a lower price point, because then you're not also buying a very, very fancy. There, Yeah, you're showing yours off. I can get the Quest if you want to see it. You want to see it? Here, I'll grab yeah, it. Yeah, sure. This is the, yeah, because what I'm showing is the Oculus Go, which is uh, not as powerful, but it's got that same portability uh, situation. Mm -hmm. There you go. The so Quest same portability. This is the whole thing. And what I love about this, and this is going to sound really silly, but bear with me. If you were, say, laying in bed next to your partner, or you have a roommate who shares a room with you, and you want to watch TV before bed without disturbing them, boo, there it is. Uh, if you want to take it on an airplane, you can do that. I mean, if you don't feel like you're looking silly, but I mean, this is kind of the VR dream. And previously with the Oculus Go and some other standalone headsets that didn't quite have the processing power, you were very limited in terms of software. So the games you could play were more like demos, which were kind of fun as like a party trick to show your aunt, but nothing you were going to spend five, six hours on. Um, this has Beat Saber, like this has super hot VR. This has a lot of really great quality games on it and it's standalone. So I've taken this, I take this on vacation with me usually. And uh, it's pretty fun to be able to do that with a headset. So that's $4.99 for the 64 gigabyte and, uh, or I'm sorry, $3.99 for the 64 and $4.99 for the 128. Pretty now cool. Now the, the, the next one on your list is also a good portable. Yeah, also also a good portable is the Nintendo Switch. Uh, and Nintendo Switch now announced their Lite version. So if you want to get a Nintendo Switch, but for $1.99 instead of $2.99, you are going to lose the detachable Joy-Cons. So you're going to lose a lot of the uh, motion control and rumble in your Joy-Cons. But you still get access to a ton of really, really amazing Nintendo games just in the handheld variety instead of being able to switch it from console to handheld, et cetera. And Nintendo's not going to get replaced within the next year the way Sony and Microsoft are. So that's another another consideration. But um, yeah, it's true. Um, so speaking of Xbox, the Elite Series 2 Xbox controller came out fairly recently. And uh, if you've ever held the first uh, Elite controller, it feels really nice in hand. The two feels the same way. It might even be a little bit heavier, which I really like that feel in a controller. Um, it's just, it's, it's a really nice controller with things like adjustable tension on your thumbsticks, um, shorter hair trigger locks. You can you can customize them to whatever feels good for you. The wraparound rubberized grip feels really, really nice. And uh, yeah, it's just an upgrade. So if you have someone that's a diehard Xbox gamer, those could be some good options for them. And I believe the Elite Series 2 retails for around $180 MSRP. But although with Black Friday deals, you might be able to get it better. I don't, are you guys particular about your controllers when you sit down to play games? I, I'm i not actually, because I'm so bad anyway. Like it doesn't really matter. I just, I, I just use whatever's in front of me. I, maybe you, just, oh, maybe right. you I, just need the right controller. <laughs> I, I've just learned to uh, deal with it, which is really bad for video games. <laughs> <laughs> See, we're the we're the people who need the Elite Series Two Xbox controller, right? So so that we could actually uh, get get over this uh, problem. But of course, there are plenty of gamers who have all the gear they need, and yep. you might want to get them some games. What should we get them? Yeah, so some games that are pretty big. Uh, Star Wars Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order just came out from Respawn, and people are saying. This is the best Star Wars game since Knights of the Old Republic. This is the Star Wars game everyone's been waiting for. Respawn's been kicking it out of the park lately, um, and it's available for PS4, Xbox One, and PC. So if you have a Star Wars fan in your life, this, I mean, just the melee lightsaber combat feels real good. Um, so I highly recommend that. Also, a game that came out probably a couple months ago now, but this year, Control by Remedy Games. 
It's not on a lot of people's radar, although if you work in the video games industry, it's got all the buzz. People in the industry really, really loved it and touted it. But yeah, I don't think your mass population knows about it. But if you are buying for a gamer who's really into X-Files slash UFO sighting, conspiracy theory, paranormal activity lore, like that type of genre, you are going to love this game. I just finished it. It's very difficult. They do have some accessibility options in there. If uh, Tom, like you stated, you are, if you're not so great at these games, but you want to experience the story anyway, they have mouse aim assist, which as a keyboard and oh, mouse yeah. player, who's not great at shooters, I super appreciated mouse aim assist. Um, but that game is just, the gameplay is wonderful. You really feel like a superhero in late game and it's by Remedy. So it's in the same fictional universe as the Alan Wake games. Oh, cool. Just really, really well done. If you're a fan of Remedy games, you're going to love this. Um, it was funny. I was streaming, and I just finished the playthrough last week of this game, and a lot of members of my chat were like, this is Remedy AF, and that's probably <laughs> the best way to describe it, but <laughs> really, good really good game. <laughs> um, and that's available for PS4, Xbox One, and PC, but only on the Epic Game Store. It won't come out for Steam until next year. Another game that everyone's talking about right now is The Outer Worlds. Uh, some adult themes for sure in this, but the writing is absolutely hilarious. It's uh, Obsidian that did it. So if you liked Fallout New Vegas or the person you're buying for liked Fallout New Vegas, highly recommend Outer Worlds. Many, many hours of gameplay. You're you may lose that. that person. That's the only yeah. risk if you get them this. Yeah. Are you playing it, Tom? No, but I have lost a couple of, not lost friends, but I, know <laughs> I have some friends who, who kind of went off the radar uh, as they, as they <laughs> got lost in it. Yeah, I'm only partially into it for precisely that reason, because, I mean, you, if you want to do every single side quest and you're a total completionist, then yes, you can spend hundreds of hours in this game quite easily. Um, and then if you're buying for the family, Nintendo is always the clear king when it comes to family and kids games between Yoshi's Crafted World, Mario Party, Mario Kart, Luigi's Mansion 3 just came out, which has a co-op, uh, a couch co-op mode in it. Uh, Ring Fit Adventure, if you want to get physical and work out. Lots and lots and lots of options from Nintendo. And uh, if you're buying for an older gamer, the nostalgia in Zelda Link's Awakening is so mm -hmm. good. So, so, so good. It's exactly what I remember, but better. And like just the music kicks in and I teared up, I'll be honest. Um, <laughs> highly recommend. And then if you cannot decide what game to get for the person that you're buying for, um, Xbox Game Pass and game streaming and uh, I should say game subscription services, not game streaming services, because now those things are all becoming very different. Yeah, right. Um, but game subscription services like Xbox Game Pass enable the gamer to access a wide variety of different games and a whole lot of triple A's on there for one price. Now, granted, they can only play those games for as long as they still are subscribed to that service. But um, I believe it's Xbox Game Pass Ultimate that is for both PC and Xbox. And as someone who is primarily a PC gamer, that appeals very much to me. Cool. Yeah, so the, those would be the hot hits that I would say uh, for chat. Please go ahead, or anyone listening to this, please go ahead and write in your votes because 2019 has been an incredible year for games. Um, if you don't want to spend a lot of money on games, I should go ahead and mention the indie market is amazing. Untitled Goose Game came out this year. Slay the Spire is incredible. Uh, tons and tons and tons of great, move. if you like moving indie games, Grease, Sea of Solitude, Really, really excellent picks this year. And uh, 2020 is going to be even worse on our wallet. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Trisha. Of course. And thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. Lots of gaming stories there all the time. You can submit your own and vote on others. Get them on the show, perhaps. DailyTechNewsShow.reddit.com is our subreddit. Also, join in the conversation in our Discord. And you can join by linking to a Patreon account at Patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's take a look at the mailbag. Oh, let's. Joel, who lives over in Sweden, said, News tip from my country. Spotify has become the largest podcast platform in Sweden, according to a new study from analysis firm Media Vision. He got this from, I'm going to butcher it, Doggins Knee Hater, otherwise known as DN, uh, a, a publication uh, in the country. 
Uh, uh, Joel says 42% of daily podcast listeners in Sweden now use the Spotify app for podcasts. Mm. Apple reached 33% in the same July to September period. Joel says, I think Spotify has grown for a number of reasons. For example, they're big among young people who are the largest group of podcast listeners. Spotify also invested a lot in the podcast market, which seems to have made a difference. Uh, Spotify ha indeed launched a number of exclusive podcasts in Sweden as well over the last year, showing that Apple's dominance in podcasts may not be set in stone. Yeah, thank you, Joel, uh, for writing in. Joel is the editor-in-chief of Surfa.se, uh, which is not related to DN, which he he quoted in his email there, uh, or Spotify, but he said he's a fan of the show and wanted to to share some intra insight. So thank you, Joel. Very uh, Joel cool, Joel. You're the best. You are. You know who else is the best? Our oh. patrons at our master oh, yeah. and grandmaster levels, including Dan Dorado Hankins, John Johnston, and Chris Smith. Uh, so much best on this show, because also the best is Len Peralta, who's been busily <laughs> il illustrating uh, this show. What have you drawn for us today, Len? You know, I'm super excited for all the games and everything else that uh, Trisha was talking about. Uh, but, you know, I'm also excited about the uh, the cyber truck as well. I know it's a little while before it comes out, but, uh, you know, I'm a one for misinformation. And uh, here's an image of the cyber <laughs> truck, which makes a great gift for the uh, for the holiday. And uh, Trisha Hirschberger, of course, said that this was the best video game for the holidays. And uh, so there you go. That's uh, there's, this there's is, also a, a baby Yoda. There's also a baby Yoda. And, 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 a baby I, and I hope baby Yoda is going to be OK when the Cybertruck comes you know, back to Earth. Well, tune in. Episode yeah. three to see what happens. Um, so, yeah, so this is available right now. It's on the front page of my store, lenperaltstore.com, along with the Rise of Skywalker DTNS poster, which is available for sale right now as well. Also, I'm doing custom-drawn holiday cards again. So uh, that's maybe something you may want to think about as we get into the holiday season. But uh, And also a Patreon, patreon.com forward slash len. I'm going to tell people that they will probably ruin the holidays if they don't get a custom <laughs> holiday card from That's Len Peralta. Right. I know this from experience. I've done it both ways. Go yeah. to lenperaltastore.com right now and commission him while you still have time. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Save Christmas or whatever holiday you might be uh, enjoying. You know who else is the best? Trisha Hirschberger. <laughs> Trisha, oh thanks goodness. so much for being with us today. It's been too long. Uh, it's so nice to have you. Uh, great, great tips, great insight, and let folks know where they can keep up with the rest of your work. Uh, well, thank you guys so much for having me. If people want to follow me for all the other stuff that I'm up to, you can do that on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at that girl Trish. That's no I in the girl. So it's that G R L Trish. Um, and then on YouTube or Twitch, just my name, Trisha Hirschberger, all one word. Um, so yeah, thank you guys so very much for having me. It's always lovely to come on here and chat tech with you guys. Um, and yeah, maybe, maybe we'll all get to work together on something else very soon. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Thanks again, Trish. Uh, always such good information. And uh, the reason we're all here is because of the patrons who keep this show running at patreon.com slash DTNS. We have new patron rewards, including a peek at our show rundown as we develop it. You can watch us putting stuff in before the show. Sign up right now. Patreon.com slash DTNS. And if you have feedback for us, our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. If you can join us live, it's a lot of fun. We're live Monday through Friday. 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 21.30 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back Monday with Rob Dunwood as our guest. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>